the session will investigate what the priorities for upper uh, level ontologies are. As many of you know, uh, um, MLOs and even more TLOs are often perceived as too complex and distant from, from implementation scenarios. Among other things, these difficulties can lead stakeholders to not exploiting them to the degree they could and uh, puzzling when it comes to picking one due to the lack of a clear way to compare them. Our first speaker is Professor Gedini, from, is a full professor at the University of Bologna. Research fields include plasma transport theory and the development of physical mathematical models for industrial applications. Uh, Professor Gedini is also a member of the European Material, Material Modeling Council and main developer of the MO. As such, is currently involved in a number of European projects. Okay. Professor Gedini, if you please. Thanks. Good afternoon. Sorry to bother you again after this uh, this morning. I'm going to talk about uh, the usage of standards in uh, materials ontology, and in particular, as you may suspect, uh, in the uh, EMMO. Okay. So this talk is about uh, the activity of identifying uh, of identifying um, domain knowledge source from standards uh, and formalizing and incorporating them within uh, an ontology and in particular is about the experience of doing this such exercise in the MMO. So when we uh, search about standards in, in, in domain uh, um, knowledge, we can refer usually for national application to, uh, to standard provided by standard bodies uh, that uh, is a way to ensure consent. There are several standard bodies that this doesn't help a lot by uh, by by uh, uh, asserting a unified approach to a particular um, application and also the uh, the process is a bit slow so as wikipedia point out uh, uh, there is also the risk of uh, of standards that takes too much time for uh, uh, to update itself in order to, to to capture the advancement of a technological uh, field uh, but for applied sciences, there are no such a thing as standard bodies. So uh, the consensus pro uh, is not provided by a working group. It would be also anti-scientific to decide what type of equation we should use to uh, to study fluid dynamics, for example. So this is not something that that that, that you apply to, to to applied science. So usually for science, uh, the the standard. Is, uh, uh, is is built on the field. So the, the authoritas, so the, the authority of, of someone or, or, or body is granted on the field by natural selection. And usually there is almost a full consensus of a community uh, behind a particular approach. For example, the standard model of particle, this is a, there is a word standard. Of course, it's not a standard. It's accepted by the community. So, we, so that's uh, that's what we can call also standard for, for, um, for domain. Uh, uh, knowledge. So here I'm going to present you some example of uh, usage of such standards uh, in the in the MMO. So let's start with the with the first standard that that we that we that we use to build the, our ontology. This standard has its authoritas uh, uh, from the Commission, uh, that is the, the body that is funding us, uh, at least uh, the the, uh, <laughs> the 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 project initiatives that uh, <clears throat> that. Uh, uh, provide a, a guideline that that has been used and is currently used uh, in in the European program to to uh, to define what a material is and what material modeling should be should be addressed. So the MMO is based on such a uh, on such a, a standard that, as I pointed out yesterday, provides the the, the conceptualization needed for for this ontology to uh, to describe uh, materials. Another important standard that we that we use in, in the MMO it is multi-direction of, of a standard uh, um, granted by by a standardization body because it is a CN workshop agreement that has been uh, cited by several EU organizations, in particular the European Material Modeling Council, that is about the uh, materials modeling workflow. This type of initiative has been taken because there was a lack of uh, of, um, of, of terminology, of, of consensus about the terminology to be used. So 
this uh, workshop agreement was about the definition of, of terminology and uh, uh, templates in order to document uh, the, uh, the the modeling so it was not about uh, uh, defining what modeling of material is is it was about uh, to define how to describe your modeling applied to to materials and this also uh, led us to in the in the mmo to the uh, creation of of the representation of workflow that uh, uh, that can be also now uh, executed uh, thanks to the work that we are doing in the open model uh, project so the third type of standard that we use to uh, to in the MMO uh, is the uh, EMCC standard, uh, uh, sorry, EMCC um, workshop agreement that uh, has been cited by again several uh, EU organizations uh, about the material characterization. So again, it's a standard about the terminology, the classification and metadata in order to describe characterization. So not about to define what characterization is but to describe how the, but the, the method to describe how you perform a characterization so which type of metadata you should provide uh, so that uh, uh, the community can document uh, what, what they are doing there is no mention about ontology so these standards are, are bubbling up so are generated by by the community uh, uh, without uh, uh, without any any particular requirement here, there is another important standard that I already mentioned, the standard model of particles. This is a standard coming from physics. And the, 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 the consensus has been granted on the field. So this is another, another, uh, another standard that is now part of the, of the MMO as, uh, as, as the definition of the types that, uh, of, of, the, of the meteorological uh, atom that uh, the, the, the MMO uses. Uh, to represent uh, things another standard that we are um, that we are um, using in the mmo is the the the, um, the dean norm 8580 which is about manufacturing we spent several time trying to find a, a standard in, in uh, for example in, in iso uh, about manufacturing but uh, uh, standards in this field were essentially scattered and a lot of work should have been done in order to put together a coherent system while this uh, uh, no this this, uh, uh, this standard which comes from from, from a standard body a national standard body is uh, really um, really systematic and covers a lot of things and especially it, it is it is really in line with the emmo way of thinking so this is another standard that it is uh, incorporated in the in the emmo so we are using in order to uh, understand how the community conceptualize uh, domain knowledge and this conceptualization then it is formalized and aligned with the top level of the of the mmo and in this case uh, it's been quite uh, uh, quite quite easy because it's uh, the top level ontology that the, the mmo top level ontology is really in line with such type of, of approach in describing um, uh, uh, manufacturing in particular the distinction between uh, uh, the manufacturing of, of, of materials or manufacturing of things with shapes and, and so on um, another important uh, standard, which is not a, a standard from a public body, uh, uh, but it is the, 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 the uh, authorities that uh, are an author, so in this case, Luciano Floridi, had in the, by this work in, in the philosophy of, of information, uh, uh, comes from this book, or in general from the work of this philosopher, that provides a definition of data that is uh, uh, materialistic. So data is a gradient. So it's a physical entity that provides a gradient. And this is totally in line with the, with the, with the approach of, of the MMO. So we decided that uh, uh, the conceptualization of, of, of information provided by this author was, uh, um, was um, uh, uh, had already uh, 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 authorities from in, the, in the field, uh, but also uh, it was in line with, the, with, our, with our scope. So what we did was to use this conceptualization provided by the work of this uh, philosopher of Luciano Floridi uh, to build the EMMO module for, for description of data, which is a really important, uh, really important one. Another uh, very important standard that we use is the vocabulary of meteorology, which is, again, not a standard uh, from a standard body, but it is a standard coming from the meteorology uh, community and also the SI system uh, brochure and also the ISO 
80,000 that provides the, the international system of quantity uh, formalization. So we incorporate this concept uh, and we adapt it because there are uh, there are some we had to to make some some uh, some adjustment or, or some interpretation uh, on, on uh, for this concept in order to be integrated in the in the MMO. And now we have also uh, uh, the representation of, of physical quantities in, in the MMO, which is also um, thanks to the work of, of, of Jasper uh, um, from Synthef is also um, alignable with the QEDT uh, approach. Um, here you can see, for example, the, the taxonomy uh, of, the, of the of the metrology language in the in the MMO, in which we try to capture all the most important concept that uh, comes from the vocabulary of metrology that are in common for, with every uh, system of uh, of unit. A really really important standard is the CIF. Again, this is a this is a standard coming from a, a, a community, the crystallographic community that uh, bubbled up from the community itself. They wanted to have to use a common language to share the crystallographic data. And here we are, it became, it, it, it became a standard for, 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 for uh, sharing crystallographic data. And since material are crystal or amorphous, having this in this ontology means that we covered at least half of the spectrum of, uh, of, of potential materials. And the CIF is a semantic and syntactic. So there is a syntactic structure and, and a semantic structure that has been captured uh, both by, by the MMO and, uh, and embedded in, in, their, in, in, the, in the MMO structure. So the, uh, in fact, the MMO distinguishes between the semantics, the syntactics, and the object that, uh, that you are measuring or, or you are dealing with. And uh, also uh, working with this group of, of crystallographers uh, helped a, a lot uh, to uh, to understand that uh, how our approach to uh, to representing materials is in line with how a crystallographer think so that's that's really was really important but it's not always so so easy to perform this task because as as uh, the, in the previous session has been pointed out the iso is always uh, uh, inconsistent so standards coming up from the from from the bottom are sometimes well uh, always uh, uh, inconsistent between each other and also inconsistent between themselves. For example, uh, you may refer to the IUPAC definition of a, of, of a molecule uh, because they are chemists. But if you uh, look at the definition of a molecule from a physicist, you will find that these two definitions uh, clashes together. There is also an inconsistency within the IUPAC definition of, uh, of at, between atom and molecule. The definition of atom is somewhat incompatible with the definition of a molecule made of atom because of uh, of, of a neutrality and the and the electrons and so on so this is something that uh, uh, that, that is really important and really bothers us for um, uh, when we want to to, to integrate uh, this uh, this concept in an ontology and there are also other very important, uh, uh, very important uh, uh, clashes for example from ISO 9000 or ISO 40000 uh, what is the product? Product is tangible or intangible? It depends on which uh, uh, standards you want to you want to adhere. So, uh, as the MMO, who we should choose as a standard of, of reference, as a conceptualization coming from the community that we should take and incorporate in the MMO? Well, uh, there are also other, other, other more, more complex cases, for example, verification. How can we verify the term verification? If you search the term verification in the, in the ISO, you will find several definitions. Uh, someone talk about uh, objective evidence, uh, some, some, some other talk about manufacturer and third party, other about instrument, other about greenhouse gas. So what is verification? Something that applies only to greenhouse gas, something that needs always a third body. What is it? So um, there are very important clashes in, in the ISO. There are many different ways to deal with that. We can, for example, use the which seems since pluralism seems, seems the rule. Uh, we can use the approach of rule them all. So we can adopt one and push this one and say you should adopt this one and that's it. Or we can adapt ourselves in a pluralistic way so that we respect what comes out from the field. And we try to develop a, a framework that adapts itself and can host several and different uh, conceptualization of the of the same domain. And this is really in line with what Onto Commons 
is, uh, uh, is doing. Um, so developing a pluralistic uh, environment for, uh, for hosting concept, uh, uh, in different concept in, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a same framework. So how do we deal with this pluralism in the MMO? Well, an important thing is that uh, usually when we define uh, a standard, when a standard bubble, bubbles up, uh, is they focus on natural language term. So that are univocally associated to a concept. So it's like that, that, that uh, a community or standard body appropriates uh, a particular term to a particular and collect to, to, to a concept uh, rigidly. And this excludes the consistence of term of standards that define slightly different concepts under the same terms. So one of the solutions that we found is that we should forget label, so terms. We should think about concept and not about terms. So the idea, uh, we, which is, which is uh, uh, counterintuitive, because when we talk about each other, when we talk uh, with each other, we use a, a, a term in order to refer to a concept. We cannot use the language of the ant, uh, for example, if you want, if, if you are a token uh, fan, to describe things. It would took us hours to express uh, one, one single, uh, the concept behind, uh, behind a word. So the coupling the, co the terms, uh, the label to the concept is, is a first approach and also to uh, agnostify to, to 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 render the concept agnostic by using uh, alphanumerical uh, uh, ids to connect uh, to uh, to concept also another uh, another another strategy is, is, is to use perspectives which are the way in which mmo is uh, uh, it may host a different uh, way of the world that, that may coexist at the same, in the same ontology and also to define broader concepts and summarize several specific concepts like we did in, in, the, in, the, in the bridge concept in Ontocommons. So representing existing standards using a top-level ontology is a way to facilitate ontology adoption. However, uh, inconsistency in standards required to deal with pluralistic approach concept representation. So the MMO is approaching standard as raw knowledge material. They are raw knowledge, so pre-conceptualization of, of, of what exists in the in the knowledge uh, domain. The strategy of the MMO is to develop an ontological framework that is respectful of the standard that emerge from the bottom and flexible enough to incorporate most of them in, uh, in uh, and let them coexist. While the opposite direction, so proposing ontology-based methodology for, for the formalization of domain knowledge in standards may be not practically feasible. One of the risks is to fall into the standardization trap in which uh, you want to propose a standard to rule them all, but in the end, it will be only another source of, uh, uh, of, of, of confusion or you are putting another, another buy. So that's, um, that's it. Thanks. Many thanks to Professor Guidini for the talk. Uh, our, next, our next speaker is Chris Partridge. Chris Partridge is a chief ontologist at Sporo Solutions. is a prime developer of the Sporo methodology and the, the Sporo Foundation, which have been used in a number of standards. Dr. Partridge has put forward in-depth studies of TLOs, both from uh, an abstract and applicative point of view, and is currently involved in the development of the information management framework. I think I'm going to carry on the same theme as Emanuele, which is this concerns about um, standards. And I think I'm going to make a slightly different argument. Uh, Emanuele was probably doing the, um, uh, I will assimilate the standards. I'm going to argue I don't want standards, at least for a particular thing, uh, the particular field that I'm interested in. Um, I'm going to um, uh, do this in three sections give you a motivation i was what i didn't originally didn't have the motivation here but i think i probably should explain i have a particular perspective of this i'm sure there are ontological areas where standards are useful and, and wonderful it's just that i don't think they're particularly useful in my in, in the field that i'm working in and i want to frame it by talking about the uh, this notion of premature standardization i think if you're from a an it background you'll be familiar with the notion of premature uh, various different things, premature generalization, premature standardization. Um, <clears throat> I actually looked up on uh, GPT, no, it was Google, I think, premature uh, standardization, and there are all sorts of other premature things that are bad. So if you've got a premature um, adjective in front of whatever you're doing, it, it's probably bad. I mean, I, 
I'm, 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 I'm not, uh, I'm uh, being slightly facetious here. Standardization is good in certain places, okay. So just to, just quickly to go to the motivation, by the way, I'm rushing through the slides. I have um, slightly more slides than there are minutes to speak. So I have under a minute for each slide, which is my normal way of doing things. So I work in a, a niche area and you struggle for names. Barry's actually good with names. Apparently we should recruit Barry to give a name for the kind of work we're doing. So I'm, I'm calling it operational system semantic interoperability and integration. So the problems that we face, if you've got a large enterprise system like SAP and Maximo, how do you integrate it? You could do it synchronously or asynchronously. We tend to prefer asynchronously because it takes a long time. How do you, you get your data in such a way that the data from both systems can be uh, seen from a, a single perspective and worked with without there being significantly high cost. I think the cost of data exchange is an area, we'll come to that in one of the fu uh, future slides, is something that hasn't really been investigated in a way that enables you to put a frame framework around either what the costs are or the benefits are. I've, I've been working for this uh, for a little while, since the late, late, late 1980s, and I'm not sure So, if there's anyone else working in this area. Now, that could be... a a good or a bad sign, I let you choose. If you do think you're working in the area, I'd, I'd be happy to meet you, it'd be great. Um, so, uh, riffing on something that Michaela talked about yesterday is that uh, I think there are opportunities for innovation, something that um, uh, I'm using the term architectural, which apparently means it's, it's an innovation that's very radi radical and disruptive. Um, in, in, in my area, and I'm not trying to be exclusive, it's not just my area, I'm sure all the other areas, there's all sorts of opportunities for, for innovation. Um, and I think that when you're in the early stages, and it's strange, it, well, you could argue it's strange that we've been in the early stages for over 30 years, but if you look at the history of information, it's not quite so strange. I'm saying that we're, we're still in the early adopters phase, and certainly from a market diffusion point of view, if you look at the size of the market, it's plain from the size of the market that you're in an early adopter stage. And I think the standard notion is that this is a, it's really important to be agile at this, at this stage because any attempt at conformity basically stifles innovation. Um, and I think this, this process of attempting to standardize that, the temptation, I was wondering whether to try and do some riff on the temptation of standardization. The temptation of standardization is there because you can think, oh, if we just do this, if we standardize, we'll be interoperable. But, I wish you luck, okay. So I'm not trying to say that there shouldn't be standards in general. There are definitely benefits of standards, but just they've got a, it's a question of balancing the conformity of standards with the, the agility that you, the, the lack of conformity that you need to produce innovation. And one of the things I think, one of the ways of you can think about it, and I've been trying to frame a way of thinking about it uh, based on the experience that I've got working is trying to recognize when you're probably premature, prematurely standardizing. Uh, and I particularly want to argue that it's not yet time to standardize in the, the particular area I work in. Okay, so uh, just this is just really quick background. In, in the work that we do, I think we're slightly unusual is that we focus not just on the, the end on ontology, the foundational ontology, the top ontology, but also the, the formal, formalization process and how you formalize the formalization process and how you do that in a way that's scalable. So costs are really, really important. If you, when you're working at enterprise level systems, you've got you know tens of millions, hundreds of millions of um, uh, entities to refactor and play with. It, the the cost of formalization uh, becomes a serious factor. Um, the other thing is we tend to work bottom up and top down. So if we're going to formalize in an area, we'd start with the data, with the particulars, with the instances and, and move up. And we have the formal ontology at the top. So we've got this, this two, uh, if you like, this, this boundary at the top and the bottom, uh, which we squeeze, uh, where we squeeze the ontology out. And again, I think that's different as a process from the way in which um, uh, other people may approach. And I'm happy if you claim that you do it the same way, that's great because if you're following the way I'm doing it. You must be doing it the right way. Um, I would also like to do, and I talked to Michaela about this, is just to get clear what, for me, semantic interoperability is. And I think we need to distinguish between, uh, a nice distinction to make is between intra and interoperability. It's a convenient fiction that within the enterprise systems, it's easy to do a query across the internals of the system. These systems actually, I don't know, mishmashes from normally of an enormous history with things being mishmashed together. So it isn't actually that easy to 
integrate data across the bits and pieces inside the system. But let's assume for a moment this, this fiction is true. The problem then comes when you try and integrate with another system. People working with data lakes will be familiar with this. You dump all the data in the lake and then you've now got an enormous amount of work to do to try and get it to work together. So the idea is, is that the cost, and remember I'm, earlier I mentioned this, uh, the cost, the cost of doing a inter-system query should be roughly the same order of magnitude as an intrasystem query. That's when you know that you've achieved operational semantic interoperability. Oh, and the quality of the result should be such that you're prepared to make operational decisions based on it. Oh, and notice as well, this is machines talking to machines now, no humans involved. And I think this is a, a probably a more stringent requirement than some of the other uh, discussions of interoperability uh, that I've heard today. Um, okay. So uh, we're doing a lot of work with um, uh, large language models at the moment. So <laughs> as they, I don't think they could, I mean, they can't speak, but I can, I can read what this produced. So I put the question into chat GPT and then um, it came up. So at least chat GPT thinks there are a number of problems with premature standardization. There's another, uh, another thing, um, another large language model perplexity, which I quite like because it gives you the references. It tells you where you've got the stuff from. Interestingly, it came up with a, a very, very similar set of, issues about um, 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 premature standardization. I then thought, look, I'm biased. I'm saying, you know, it's like coming in saying, what's the problem with premature standardization? I should try and ask a more neutral question. So I went back to chat GPT and I, I, on a new chat, by the way, so didn't know that uh, it was meant to be doing the same thing. I said, what are the benefits of standardization? And even here it says, oh, be careful. You know, it's not always a good idea to standardize. Um, so, uh, what I what I take away from this at a very and I, I'm happy that if you come back with discussions, I agree that this wasn't a in depth six month study of what's going on, but it does seem to be that there are there's a view that there are some serious issues with premature standardization. I mean, it was no surprise for me. It's sort of if you work in the IT industry, you're you're familiar with these issues, and I think the the, the thing that comes up is this problem about stifling innovation. If you if you standardize too early, you've got when you suddenly realize you've done something the wrong way, the cost of change is so high that you just don't do it. And that's a, that bedevils lots and lots of um, IT projects. So we have a tension between standardization and innovation. I, I quite like this. Um, if you go through the, uh, the literature, normally the blogs, not the uh, academic literature, there's a lot of nice ad hominem arguments. So apparently um, managers standardize prematurely because standardizing is the only real skill they possess. A little bit mean. I mean, there may be some truth in it. Um, if you stand back a bit, what you see is that there are, as, a, as with everything, it's a trade-off exercise. You need to balance the conformity you get with standards. Uh, you would say there's a certain kind of quality that if I'm going to use an ad hominem argument, the managers like because they know that everything's uh, had the same uh, process applied to it, not because it's necessarily any better. Um, but I think there is an issue about finding the right balance. Um, one of the things that it seems to me that ontology, at least the way it's framed, is actually a technology here, maybe a conceptual technology. So we're talking about techno technology change of a certain kind, and particularly information technology change of a certain kind. So if we're trying to, if you like, zoom in the area that we're trying to standardize. Now, if we're trying to do the lots of standards, say, for instance, for pipe sizes, uh, for pipe materials and stuff like that. Um, I'm sure with uh, Manuele, who could probably tell us about this. Is So So, uh, I think what we're dealing with here, at least if you just take uh, the focus board being ontology, is something that is to do with IT systems. And again, we've got the same sort of thing here. If you look if you look in the, in the literature, particularly on the blogs, you get this, um, um, this, this worry about people being tempted to standardize too soon. And again, um, We've got a, a rather acid comment here about um, uh, the, the uh, one of the, the perceived benefits are is that the customers will like it. So it's not improving quality; it's just easier to sell. Also, you should note there's a difference here between local and global. So you could argue that in I'm, I'm going to standardize on my particular ontology in uh, this particular piece of work. And in fact, if you're working with an ontology, you probably want for a period of time to try and agree to conform and work, work in a certain way. But I think by the time you get up to ISO standards, you're sort of implying that this should be 
if not local, regional, and getting close to global. And certainly from Barry, his early comments, his, um, his ambitions are definitely global. Um, so if we go now to uh, balancing considerations, and what I'm trying to do here is give you, uh, I hope to give you a way of thinking about what's going on and where you should position yourself. So a way to ask the question of, have I balanced it the right way? Is it a premature standardization or not? So this is, if you like, giving you some conceptual tools to um, uh, to deal with this. I mean, I apologize in advance if it's absolutely obvious to everyone that premature standardization is bad and that ontology is currently in an early adopter phase, so therefore it'd be crazy to standardize. I mean, if everyone agrees with that, then in a sense, I'm, my mission is, my, I don't have to worry about my mission. There's, um, there's, uh, it's, um, it's, um, I'm fighting against, the, or I'm pushing against an open door. Um, one of the ways I found useful to think about the role the role ontology is playing is that it's an evolution. If you if you take an evolutionary view of information, it's a next stage forward in terms of evolution. Ontology is a, a way of regimenting information that, or formal ontology is a way of regimenting information that's been enabled by uh, computing technology. This, I think the story is slightly different. I think it's probably the other way around is that work on ontology enabled the computing revolution, but that's, that's another story. Um, uh, and if you do that, you, you would see the information, the evolution of information, and people do see the information, the evolution of information as cultural evolution. Cultural evolution in the last couple of decades has become more acceptable. Uh, and they've also accepted that it's probably Lamarckian rather than Darwinian in some of its characteristics. Um, there is a, uh, a theory called recapitulation theory that had this nice um, logo um, Haeckel came up with, on, on, ontogeny recapit recapitulates phylogeny. And so the idea is that the trait evolved for the phylum, the phylum's now acquired the trait, and the cultural practice is stable. And the way it stabilizes itself is that the individuals actually recapitulate the uh, evolutionary history of the um, uh, of the phylum, and that's the way in which the cultural practice is, uh, if you like, is stabilized within the phylum. Uh, this is a, a big issue, uh, cultural horizontal transmission, and I think links back to something that was discussed earlier. We're saying, how do we train people? I think there's a session on training as well. Training essentially from an evolutionary perspective, perspective is cultural horizontal transmission. I think what happens for an innovating cultural trait, one of the things I've noticed, this is the other way around, is that you want the phylogeny to recapitulate the ontogeny. So in other words, they're going to be individuals who are doing this work. They're going to be, if you take the market diffusion thing, they're going to be the early adopters. There's going to be a very small number of them. There are probably lots of people going to be trying things. Lots of people will fail. Some will succeed. And as they succeed, the number of people doing it will grow bigger until the whole is picked up in the community, in the phylum. And then you go to this uh, case where the, the um, ontogeny recapitulates phylogeny. But first, you go through this, you, you're going through this phase where you're trying to get the phylogeny to re recapitulate the ontogeny. And I think for certain bits of the ontology work, we're definitely um, in this um, uh, second stage. If you read the literature on uh, standardization, there's a, a nice way of, I think, framing the issue, whether it's ex ante or ex post. Um, and the idea of ex ante is you say, oh, we've got to do this work. It's really difficult. No one wants to do. So we're going to set up a set of standards. So we're going to make sure everyone does it the same way. And that's going to save us a lot of time because everyone will do it the same way. We can be sure of the quality because we know what the quality standards are. But it assumes, if you like a rationalist perspective, it assumes we know how to do this. But in, in a funny sense is that how, if something's innovative, how can you know how to do it? It's sort of a, there's some sort of incongruity incongru in the, uh, the approach. And so I think what the ex post says, well, let's say, let's try it out. And when we've tried it out, we know how we're going to standardize it. And that's more of an imposed approach. And I think the, pro the rationalist approach is, as you can see just from the way I'm describing it, well, you can see it in the text as well, is, is more prone to the, the problems of premature standardization. This, this belief that standardization is inherently good of itself in any situation. So if we do it, we'll be okay because we're all following a standard. How am I doing for time? Two minutes, okay. I'll, I'll try and rush very quickly through this. I'm not actually sure. Oh, I've got quite a few slides. Okay, there's more crossing the chasm. 
he takes the uh, um, the uh, Rogers uh, market diffusion picture where you've got early adopters, early majority and innovators and says, look, if you can actually say roughly when you want to start doing it, where you've got um, uh, round about 13, where you're in the early adopter stage, so you've got a substantial uptake, but now now the uh, you get into a, an issue of scale where it makes it's a benefit to have a standard. Uh, that's a, if you like, more suggestion. It seems to be roughly right. I'm sure it varies in different cases. The issue is, I think, and maybe we haven't got time for it, it's an interesting question about what the market is. But the, the other question, which we'll come back to later, is how are the various technology deployed across the market? So I think I've mentioned already that, that we want to deal with this evolutionary view, the idea that there is this um, cultural phylum called information that it evolves over time. And you can see the evolution is some kind of, if you're in the enterprise, you don't like to call it evolution, some kind of digitalization journey. But a digitalization journey that stretches back to, um, I don't know, way beyond the early primates. Um, there are various, I've been trying in various ways to try and put a very simple and simplistic uh, view over, if you like, the, the, um, uh, the information evolution. Here is, is one bit, I think, I think, I don't know where I put my, did I put it in? No, I, I was going to put some um, um, uh, links into to various other presentations where I've talked about it a bit more. Um, so there, this is this is the historical thing. I mean, pretty standard, pre-oral, oral, um, uh, and literate. Um, the interesting thing is is that if you start looking in, there's a, the the literate phase seems to divide into two: one pre-printing and uh, one post-printing. And I think there's a similar, you can make a similar distinction at the data level to do with processing. We can process data reasonably well now, we can't share it very well. So there are various distinctions that you can make. I'm not trying to claim that these are right, but I just want to try and get you to work out how you want to put, uh, what kind of stages you would like to put on the digital journey and see how it maps out. And the last thing, and I think there's one more slide after this, is that I think you can then use the market too far? Oh, so, okay. Is that you can actually turn the, if you turn the um, uh, Rogers um, uh, uh, market diffusion thing the other way around, so you have the laggards on the left, you're going to say of the things we're doing at the moment where we are, and you can say, look, there are enterprises that are totally paper-based. I mean, I've come across them. So they are, if you like, they're the laggards, they're the small bit. There are some people where you have digitized paper, but no real databases at all, or digitized paper and maybe forms and sets of Excel and so on. But I think what I'm, I would argue that the, the, the thing that I talked about at the beginning, which is where you have these um, uh, operational interoperability, we're really at the very early stage. There are very, very few people doing it now. And it doesn't make sense to try and say, look, you should standardize. In fact, it makes sense not to standardize it, to give people as much space to try all the different things to find out what's going to work. Um, so this is the claim I make. I mean, yeah. That the, in the later stages of the, which will be digitalization journey, a later stage of the digitalization journey, we should be pre-standardization. Standard, any standardization there would be premature. I think that's another. Yeah. Oh. Any thanks, Next on the podium is uh, Stefano Borgo. Stefano Borgo is a senior researcher at AIS STC part of the Italian Research Institute. Dr. Borgo has a background in mathematics and information technology. Uh, also, his work is marked by a multidisciplinary approach. Besides contributing to the development of Dolce, Dr. Borgo occupies core position in applied ontology and the semantic web journal, as well as uh, in the uh, Yahoo. So, it's up to you. Thank you. Is it running? It's short. Okay. So maybe I can start uh, uh, telling you that uh, if you have a, a, a religious attitude toward uh, an ontology like uh, Bafo, I'm probably not going to tell you anything interesting. And if you have a religious attitude towards uh, Dolce, I would be interested to know why. But again, I would not have uh, anything to tell you. Uh, so this is a different uh, kind of approach uh, that we are trying to, to push. Uh, and so if uh, your ontology is X, Y, Z, uh, and uh, you love it so much that you want, don't want to put in under discussion or compare to the others, but probably you, you might have fun staying here, but you will not get much out of it. 
the report, uh, this, this talk uh, is kind of a report about a special issue where special means uh, it's really amazing that it was completed. And uh, I'm going to tell you uh, why uh, this is so. Uh, it came out in Applied Ontology uh, last year with uh, um, thanks uh, to the Onto Commons uh, project, by the way. It talks about foundational ontologies per se, but uh, actually mean, it means uh, foundational and formal. Uh, there are different ways to understand this. Uh, there, there were uh, interesting uh, discussions uh, many years ago about that, but uh, here there are some ways to look at that. Uh, and, depends on the types of uh, entities in relation you, uh, you talk about. Uh, you want to be uh, general, reliable, well-organized, uh, or, or things that uh, uh, in this community we should take, uh, I believe we can take it for granted. Uh, besides the foundational aspect, there is a formal aspect uh, which uh, may have a different meaning as well. Uh, but uh, uh, primarily here, it, it means uh, that uh, you have uh, a logical form formalization of uh, the ontology. Uh, that's because uh, um, we want to avoid the uh, ambiguity of the terms using uh, in applications with another ambiguity of terms used in uh, ontology. And so the, the logic is a way to escape uh, this problem. Um, how did we get to this uh, special issue? Uh, uh, you can always uh, build history from your own perspective. This is one. Uh, in the 90s, uh, there were a lot of uh, uh, discussion about the motivations and principles and even the needs for the ontology, ontological approach. Uh, around the, um, the turn of the century, we started to have a formal construction of this uh, uh, large system, which, as you know, by now, they are very complicated. And uh, around 2010, uh, uh, I, I like to think that the attention or if you want a more exciting aspect, move uh, into the exploitation of uh, those ontologies into uh, domain applications. And uh, more recently, there has been another term, uh, um, which is uh, what this special issue is about, uh, and that I call the scientific term. So essentially, uh, people uh, um, in application, they do not need to discuss philosophical principles, of course. Uh, they don't have the background, and the power is not even relevant uh, to them. Uh, so this philosophical point of view are uh, important when you build uh, those kind of, uh, of uh, ontologies, uh, not much uh, uh, for the knowledge engineer. And uh, uh, the idea behind, the, uh, behind uh, this view is that uh, um, the application determines what you want to, to talk about, and the foundational ontology having this philosophical background and motivations help you to decide how to talk about that thing. So if we keep this in mind, then we can separate the role of each system. Today, we understand quite a lot about foundation ontologies, how to build them, how to understand them, how to describe them to some degree. Uh, but uh, the complexity of the system makes it harder to communicate uh, uh, even the, the, the basic uh, relevant part uh, to the practitioner. And the same time, the practitioner uh, fails to follow the principle behind the uh, uh, conditional ontologies. And uh, let's say we haven't done a very good job uh, in uh, improving this. Uh, so, uh, you, you probably have the same experience when you uh, review a paper on domain ontology and you kind of have a bit of puzzle to say, okay, you adopted that foundation ontology, but then you make choices that are not really coherent with that. And you accept this because you know you want to talk about something and it would be harder to try to investigate and say, well, this is the right way to do it. So you say, well, that's people have to, to do, produce, and use stuff, so let them do it. You might make some observations, say, well, look, maybe you should separate these two classes because even though the ontology has their name, that does not mean what you're using here. So try to be a little bit careful, but um, but at the end, you let them do it. And that, that is a problem, but it's a problem because we don't know how to solve it today. So, But the, the, the idea is that we could and we should do better, but how can we do that? Now I have to 
uh, start from uh, uh, a motivation or a justification of why we, as a, as a, uh, uh, as a group, uh, uh, start in, in investigating this. So LOA is known, uh, the Laboratory for Applied Ontology is known for the Deutsche Ontology, which is what we built in 2002 already. So it has a good uh, impact, at least it's, it put the bar of how uh, uh, top level of formal ontologies, uh, foundational formal ontologies should be presented and discussed. And then uh, we started working with uh, whatever else was interesting and people were available for. So we, we worked uh, with uh, BFO, especially at the beginning, and again in this project with the uh, UFO for uh, uh, several years, with the Amato, there is an uh, ongoing uh, collaboration, and more recently with, uh, with the EMO. So everything is very um, challenging and, uh, and hard because these are all complicated systems. Uh, but the, the, the gist of this is that uh, we work on foundation ontologies with a scientific attitude. That, that's what we care about. And that's why I started telling you that if you don't take this attitude, I'm not going to tell you anything interesting. So you, since you are the guy that decides to do an ontology, you pick uh, uh, your choices, uh, your ontological uh, commitments. Then we can help you to understand if they work, if they are coherent, not philosophically, that's your choice, right? But uh, logically and conceptually, and in terms of modeling, that we can help on that. And then we can also help to see if there is actually something that uh, um, has an impact. So if, if there is something you can do better with this point of view. Now, the special issue started with the six uh, teams, uh, well, let's say the six foundational ontologies, uh, the, the teams uh, agreed to work with that, so BAFO, Dolce, GFO, GAM, UFO, and Yamato. And later, as we learned this morning, uh, another ontology joined because it, it became actually uh, uh, relevant enough or developed enough uh, to be part of it uh, since the attitude was uh, uh, was the right one. You, you see that there are ontologies quite famous out there which are not here. That there was a choice because a foundation means something important here, especially in terms of attitudes towards the philosophical motivation and the, the interest in describing it uh, beyond the fact that then you have a, a coherent logical uh, theory that supports uh, what you claim. So not all the group were really cooperative, and that's why it took five years to complete uh, uh, this project. Not uh, everybody was willing to write uh, according to the guidelines uh, we gave, uh, and especially to write models that at the end could be comparable. Because if we, not com if we cannot compare the models, there was no reason to do the special issue. But at the end, something uh, good came out, not as good as uh, we hoped, uh, but uh, it came out. When I say we now, I talk about uh, the people that put the name uh, on the special issue. And these are myself, uh, Oliver Kutz, uh, and Anthony uh, Goldson. Uh, so at the beginning, I was telling you why Laura as a group is interested in this uh, scientific approach. But then the names of that, uh, so the people that put the face on the special issue are uh, those three. Uh, the point here is what do you want to compare? Uh, and the, the, the reason of using formal ontology is because you get logical theories. And that's where you drop all your beliefs and you start saying, okay, let's see what is in the logic. Uh, you also have to uh, set uh, some benchmarks that make sense to everybody. They must be clear and mutually agreed. That, in fact, uh, the, the specialist issue started with a workshop where uh, uh, the groups participated, and uh, we listed a, a series of uh, use cases and say, okay, what do you think about this on that? How should we uh, present this? Um, do we agree that uh, written down this way, they all make sense for everybody? And the point was that uh, we do not compare the ontologies. That, that's not our job. That's, uh, no, if you want to compare the, the ontological uh, uh, um, commitments, that's fine, but that's another game. We compare what comes out from them. So the models 
that you somehow are producing taking that perspective. And on the models, we can say a lot because those are formal models that have to be able to deal with the data. And the data is what we care about at the end. So uh, in doing the comparison, then you have to say, what can I actually measure with that? And you can do several things, the expressivity of the ontology, the flexibility of the model, the parsimony, and here, of course, it's a complicated issue. It can be the domain, the relations, the formulas, combination of them. Then the interoperability, as we know, we are all using the term for, uh, interoperability, but none of us define it precisely, and that's a bit puzzling. Um, we will one day try to list uh, what it means, at least at the different levels of comparison we want to do. And then other more uh, standard issues like computability properties and other logical properties. Then again, to get a benchmark, you have to separate uh, what is really about the, the ontological aspect and what is more contextual. So here I try to separate them. Uh, on the core issues, the case must make sense for any of the foundation ontologies. This means that uh, if you take another set of ontologies, probably you have to discuss uh, the cases. It might be, at least. The case cannot adopt the specific ontological principles because they are automatically saying some of them are wrong. <laughs> That's not the point. The case cannot imply the existence of certain entities or structures. Uh, unless all the ontologies they are comparing are already committed to that. So again, uh, you have to be fair, you have to accept all points of view and try to find a way to make, uh, to, to not to impose something that uh, some ontology that does not want to have in the system. And at the end of the case, should have a focus. Uh, must be a reason, something that you get, learn out of uh, uh, a single uh, use case. Then uh, more on the more practical side, the case should be clear for any point of view. The case should be of broad interest. And finally, it should allow you to highlight modeling patterns. At the end, the modeling pattern is what you're going to use, right? And that's, uh, that's uh, a key point. Uh, so, some problems. The comparison is useful if the ontologies are stable. And again, uh, I'm not talking about the ontologies as a philosophical position. I'm talking about the logical theories. Now, some ontologies change quite often. So that's not a criticism. It's just a choice uh, of the groups uh, and for whatever reason. And we are just, uh, we need to register that because then the comparison might be obsolete very quickly. So uh, BAFO, in terms of logical theory, has changed a lot over the years. We had even a problem in making the, the, the Deutsche BAFO comparison during the Ontocommerce project because we didn't know which version to use. So this is something that uh, somehow a comparison to be, um, to be informative uh, um, has to be addressed. Uh, Deutsche is very stable, meaning that we always refer to the version of 2002, or officially stated in 2003, um, even though if you change the logic, uh, logic language, of course, the axiomatization changes, but that's a different problem. Uh, GFO, for instance, has been quite stable for a, a lot of time, but now is uh, undergoing a major revision. Uh, Gamma uh, is a different kind of ontology, so that's the other aspect that we have to take into consideration, the fact that if the ontologies start to be very different, it's really hard to find uh, uh, use cases that make sense to, for all of them. Uh, Tapper is new, uh, it's only available uh, uh, to, to in some parts, let's say, it's uh, under development. Uh, other ontologies like UFO have a problem that uh, they, they have a lot of proliferation papers, and then there is no really guideline. So papers may be about similar things, but there is no real guideline of which one you should use. And that's probably something that uh, they will uh, uh, solve. Uh, but at, at the moment, uh, we, we had that issue. And, uh, and Yamato is uh, quite stable. It's uh, probably one of the oldest ontologies, but uh, um, first of the logic is only partially uh, schematized. 
Problem number two, the benchmarks need to address real cases in a way that are significant to the knowledge engineers, because we are doing this for the people in the application to be able to understand which ontology uh, perform better uh, for uh, that domain of uh, that kind of, uh, of uh, problem. Does the result depend on the granularity of the case? And that's another issue that uh, I, I wouldn't be able to answer only in some cases. Um, so that's why at the moment, uh, I would say we're still uh, using uh, use cases at, at a pretty high level. And uh, to model a case, uh, uh, the foundation ontology needs to be extended with domain concepts, which is a kind of a problem because uh, ontologists working in foundation ontologies do not like to commit to domain uh, uh, concept. It's understandable. But uh, if you if you want to do uh, something that is resemble a real case, <laughs> you have to go uh, into that direction. Problem number three: the same case can be modeled in different ways by the same uh, foundational ontologies. This is quite a common. Uh, in a sense, uh, it's uh, it's interesting. Uh, there's there's a, a quite a flexibility there. Uh, but uh, then uh, you want to compare models that uh, are uh, uh, let's say having given a use case and having different ways to model, then you want to model uh, uh, the, the, the results that more or less are similar. So I try to, to take uh, um, a similar stance when this is possible. Um, this is not uh, always possible, but it is something you have to keep in mind. Uh, the answer then is also relative to the logical language you're using. And uh, this is another issue. We, we, in the special issue, we concentrate on first order logic, unconstrained. Uh, but a lot of the work in application is done uh, in using OWL or anyway, uh, logics with uh, uh, low expressivity. And at the end, of those are the, the system they are used. Other terms like flexibility, interoperability, and parsimony are not really defined uh, or not simple notions. So there is a quite interesting discussion, uh, there was a quite interesting discussion on simplicity of uh, formal theories that could be used, but it's, uh, it's not an easy topic. So uh, to the ontocommons people here, um, I think uh, that uh, we are just uh, 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 on, a, on a path to, to find a way to compare ontologies, at least for the outcomes, and so then be able to make decisions that help uh, the practitioner to choose. So the experience that we collected, especially with the demonstrators, can be of help, because in that case, uh, you have uh, real situations, sometimes too complicated, but sometimes uh, fairly simple with data, that's, that's an interesting point to, to move on. We might exploit this experience to select a suitable scenarios, the force within the use cases that we already um, investigated in the special issue. So in a sense to make uh, the second step. Now, now we, we have a conditional ontologies and uh, they tell you, oh, this case I will model in this way. And now we need to move from here and say, OK, now I have a real case with real data. Now I push the model further. And then I have my final uh, model that I will use uh, for my applications. And then we can, we can uh, uh, start comparing those models. Because then you can compare exactly uh, what they do. And uh, it's not a, you're not judging the foundation ontologies, but you're judging how well they perform in practice. because you build a real model, a concrete model based on them. We can then select uh, uh, the available uh, foundational ontologies and develop a model in each. I, I say the available because uh, I'm, given the experience, I'm not sure everybody would like to reach this level of comparison. There is a kind of this issue of, uh, uh, yeah, you have to trust me and, don't, and don't, don't go too much uh, into uh, the really this uh, scientific uh, uh, approach. And I, I don't really know why I'm, I believe this is just a, uh, an attitude that, that uh, will fade away in the future. 
And uh, so finally, we can compare the models uh, along the dimension above and maybe others. Uh, that's, it's really an open issue how to uh, develop and, uh, and evaluate uh, the dimensions. So the, the, the message is that science, the scientific approach, does not be, build the foundation ontologies. And I'm pretty happy about that. But uh, we should not uh, give up on the use of science because it makes a difference between talking about foundational ontologies and knowing what they are, especially knowing the consequences they have in applications, which is the reason for starting this scientific term. And with this, I'm done. Thank you. Okay. And many thanks to the speakers. I invite all of you, uh, the speakers, again to the stage for the panel discussion. It will be really short because we are, but we still have some time because the other session is uh, late too, apparently. Yes. Uh, first question Do we want to come here for the question? I'm in charge. All right. I have a very quick uh, comment for Stefano. So you said on your problem number one page that Dolce was stable where BFO. Uh, I don't know, you, you, you expressed it rudely, otherwise you were quite scientific. <laughs> you said BFO is all over the place. BFO has gone through four versions exactly, and I can document them. When I tried to document the number of Dolce versions, I got into the 300s and then I gave up. You're, talk, the, you're talking about the hour version, uh, perhaps? Yeah, because okay. choosing the, the statistics with benefit, Dolce, if you only look at first order logic, there is one version of Dolce which existed for 20 years, mm -hmm. I agree, a plus 300 hour version. If you look at BFO, there are four hour versions and one first color logic version. On either okay. count, we are either equal or ahead. Okay, um, let, let, let's say in terms of versions. Uh, no, thank you, that's a, that's, a, that's, a, that's a good point. In terms of counting, I think I have a, I have a <laughs> priority over you just to, because of the degrees. But no, I, th this is correct. So we were comparing first order logic uh, versions of the of the uh, of these ontologies because uh, we wanted to to see uh, what are the consequences of this uh, philosophical yes, position, and they are expressed. Well, that's not really true. No, I mean, we had a three when we had to choose the comparison yeah. for this. Uh... We never okay. Look. The until I'd say, let, let's say the informally, so. informally. I, I don't know who's the connection. Alan gave different versions. There is one which is in the ISO, which is. I don't know, Barry. If I ask you a version, you have to give me that one. If I get three, then I don't know which one to choose. That's the point. But if you if you focus on the hour version, then you're, 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 you're right. I mean, we did not uh, um, say keep a, keep a track on the hour version. Let's say it, there was not the format, the official version. Let's say, and uh, that's because, uh, as you know, hour is not really enforcing much in terms of coherence. That, that is a problem. I, I think it's a real problem, but uh, we are not. Uh, uh, I don't see a way to solve it. Uh, but the focus here is uh, I want to know the best approximation you have in a good uh, logical language, and, and I have to choose that one. And, uh, and the problem is, sincerely, we so tried to get a place. Oh, yeah, sure. How to my change five times a year because it will show I was evolving. Yeah? So I think that you can it back to where you the keyboard, remember? Okay, then people use um, um, voice uh, recognition and my smell. I mean, things have been wrong. <laughs> I don't use the voice. I admire your, your desire for truth. Then. But Barry, there, there were differences in the axiomatization in the version we had. And there was only wow. six months from the starting of the project to the point that we have to fix one to use. That, that's, that's a problem. Now, I don't know. You might recognize only one, but we never received the information. Thanks for the question, and I'll move on to the next Should one. Go there? Yes, if you want. Uh, <laughs> if there are any questions. Yeah, 
Fact check. <laughs> I, I don't know. <laughs> After, are there any other questions from the public? Otherwise, I can. Um, there Sorry? is a long comment from no. uh, Roberto. I can show if you can show it on screen. Yes, please. It's in. A, it's a series. Of... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, should I read it? Uh, I'll try. This is correct regarding prematurity of standardization. Uh, the current ISO TLO standard is premature, having been involved in its early form and standard process. Its first draft was designed exclusively for and by a single existing ontology. Its current design remains by Biazet, Biazet and uh, now representative of global and diverse perspective on ontology, foundation of ontology. It may be a device for simulating fat. It may serve as a tactic and marketing strategy for financial gain, for attempts to gain users and to gain contacts for a given TRO. But if you consult various TRO developers of ontology professionals, many of whom were not involved in the design or input of it, they will and have expressed this prematurity and problems. So uh, if you want to comment on this, okay. Uh, it goes on. Uh, I, I mean, I think it is. Oh, it's still correlated. But if you want to answer, Chris, first, yes, because otherwise, I think we'll lose a bit of the audience. Sorry. Sorry. Oh, okay. So there was a long comment from Robert Ferreira that but otherwise, definitely, if you want to read the comment, you can also just click on the chat button. So, the, the, have a look at it. So, the second one, I yes, think the first one was Chris. Okay, it's thank a you. Bit long. It's in uh, <laughs> one, two, three, four, five, six parts. Can we set the. Uh... Can I move this? No. I don't know how that works. It's moving. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I, I cannot really say much about this. Um, so, yeah, some people have the concern. I, I, yeah, the, I'm, they're saying what I'm trying to do is, uh, uh, let's say, what I'm interested in. I'm, I'm not saying that's the, 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 the only interesting point, but what I'm interested in is to find a way to move uh, 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 research in ontology into a scientific um, uh, way to work, uh, and that we somehow have been reluctant to take that approach. That means uh, uh, you, 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 you have to constrain to what uh, you can scientifically compare, and that's the move into uh, logical theories. I'm not going to discuss philosophical ideology, it's not really a nice term I like, there are philosophical positions, they might be good or bad, I have my own preferences, I'm not going to discuss them because they are not uh, something I think I can compare scientifically. And I'm, I'm, I'll stop there. Chris? I, think, I, I remember what you said there, and I think it is a, it's an interesting question. So there was a question about imposing views on the users. It seems to me that that's just, for, for the work that I do, that's just a weird category to say. Okay, the, the computer has no views. I'm just trying to get this computer system to work more effectively. The users can make their own minds up what's going on. There's no, there's no obligation for me when I'm building my ontology to bother about the users. In fact, I, I'm really clear that subject matter experts actually probably a don't have an ontology, and b if they have an ontology, one that's not because they're brought up in a paper-based society that is of absolutely no relevance for the computer system. So you shouldn't. It's it's got nothing to do with the users. It's to do with the operating system, at least in the ontologies I work with. And this concern with trying to capture the user's 
and the underlying ontology. In my field, I think my, I, I've yet to come across a user that's got an underlying ontology. I mean, this is we're in Carnapian rational reconstruction land. The notion is just, just I, I find it weird. I mean, I accept that in other areas there might be you might want to do something like this, but to me, it's just it's, it's weird. <laughs> it's like they misunderstood the problem. I want to comment by that. And I think it links into science in some way. We were discussing this last night, Stefan. The scientist, just because someone discovered had a particular attitude to something, doesn't mean that they own the meaning. And the classic we talked about is Joseph Priestley. He, he, well, can you just think of any Norwegians here or Swedes who think we discovered oxygen? Apparently, it was Joseph Priestley who discovered oxygen, but he thought it was suggested. So when we're doing a conceptualization of our theories of oxygen, should we say, ah, oh, because he discovered it, we should be using a suggestion way of doing it. He has no rights. You're just trying to find something that works. Uh, uh, I, I had only one harsh. point. Uh, too harsh. You, you, you look at data in a computer and database, fine. Uh -huh. But you don't see numbers. You, if you, when you say data, you interpret it already. Because data are claims. So there are things that can be true or false. And they are interpreted. And you don't know, maybe. That's why having uh, an open mind in philosophical terms would help you to understand that the data might, might be a claim uh, which is not the intended one. But this is. But is issue, the issue is the intention of the original user who set it up? No, no, it's the meaning of, the, of that number. Yeah, so that it's, it's, before it comes to data. This is that that intended to, I don't know, process some form or other. When you say let's try to process this form in an efficient way, what should it intend? Then we agree. Yeah, I agree completely. All right, we have a final question from the audience. Uh, yeah, I have a question about uh, which, which might be a little bit provocative, or indirect. It is actually provocative. I, I, I'm walking out from some thin ice. <laughs> I want to ask why this preoccupation with first order logic formulations as they seem to be referred to, of ontologies. Mm -hmm. When, at least in my you know, narrow experience, uh, first order theories, they don't really ever appear in the implementations for industry and you know, incidentally happens to be set up as a project to serve the interest of uh, industry. So with a very practical, aim, uh, why the preoccupation with first order formulations of these ontologies when we know that in practice uh, the most complex ontology axiomatization that you will ever be likely to see in the wild is going to be in all the L. Uh, and generally ontologies are applied with a much lower uh, degree of formalization than even that, and just to pile on top of, of these observations, I believe strongly that uh, whichever sets of axioms in first order logic you find in various uh, foundational ontologies don't even come close to capturing the uh, actual content of uh, the concepts that are, are being quote unquote formalized. There are some certain constraints being expressed in axioms, but the claim that, that these actually capture the essence of uh, the ontological commitments that, uh, that, they're, that they're set up to, to handle that appear in their formulae, that's uh, outrageous. It's absolutely, it's not even close to likely. And, and so I, I think the, uh, the uh, basic assumption that this is a valuable or consequential uh, effort uh, should be questioned. And this would apply to, to, to the presentation uh, of, of the scientific investigation of logical uh, practice or models. It should also apply to the uh, uh, ISO 2138 uh, requirement that, uh, that we provide a uh, Common logic, personal logic, formulation of, of your culture. I don't see the relevance for the industry. And I think this is a big question. Yeah. Um, there are several things that we use every day. 
that uh, has been designed by people that uh, are uh, an understanding much deeper than the user had or says. For example, you can design a nuclear reactor using neutron transport theory and do a lot of calculation, but in the end, you will end up with a console with buttons. And so uh, it, it is like, this is a, 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 a metaphor to, to say that, uh, um, that uh, the first order logic is uh, the, a theory that is not, of course, uh, uh, completely expressive, but catches and has some syntactic and capabilities to capture uh, mm, but maybe not sufficient, but a huge amount of what you want to express about a particular, uh, a particular model, a particular, a particular conceptualization. Owl is something that is uh, a, a, a derivative work of this uh, more consistent theory. When we developed the MMO, we started with Owl. Then we decided to go back to first order logic. And what we learned is that our, our uh, conceptualization uh, was much better after creating a very consistent uh, theory in first order logic uh, to be sure that even the weaker owl uh, worked in the intended way. And beside the definition of the owl entities, there, were, there was a much more powerful and expressive theory behind that. Of course, uh, like neutron transport theory is not the perfect theory for neutron transport, uh, even first order logic is not the perfect theory to describe reality, but is a level of, pro of approximation that is uh, uh, better than, than how. Of course, you can go to, we were discussing about uh, going second order logic in order to be more expressive, but then we will lose some computability uh, because it is not, second order logic is not decidable. So, there is, first of all, the logic is a compromise for, uh, for, uh, uh, to, to build something more, more complex that can be hidden uh, when, 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 when a user uses the, the our version. That's, that's the experience that we had in the EMMO development. But maybe Stefano can be a bit more precise on that. Now, just to, to, to stay at the same level <laughs> since it was provocative. Would you buy a, a calculator that counts up to 100 just because most of the time you do the sum from 1 to 20, 30? Or would you like a calculator that anyway, cal when calculates, give you the right answer? It doesn't matter the application you, you take, right? So the point is, uh, if we have a way to make sure that uh, ambiguity is uh, avoided as much as possible, you want to use uh, that too. Then you, 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 in the application, you're right, you want to do online reasoning, okay, then you, you strip down to the, on to the, to the language that is uh, uh, effective uh, for, uh, for those constraints. But uh, you know that, that even that part uh, is strong enough because of the work that we have done uh, uh, with the other system. And that, that, that is the best we can do today. Uh, you might complain that you use a lot of resources to get uh, these uh, uh, strong results. It is true, but that's science. I mean, that, that, uh, unless you want to give up on that or, uh, attitude, uh, you, you should follow it. And you should be happy that some people are doing it for you as well. There was a raised hand in the, in the audience, but only if, a, if it is a comment, because we don't have time for another question. If it is a comment, yes. Just, just, just a quick comment. Uh, calculators really good here because uh, first order logic is uh, undecidable so you will never have calculator it always tells you that your formula are satisfiable or not while uh, for description logics they are fragments uh, that, that's correct, but the point here is to have a consistent system. So you want to have a model. You, you don't use first of logic for, yeah. for computation un unless you use some fragment, not necessarily our or description logic. There are other fragments that, that we know they are computable, maybe not efficiently, but they, they, they are decidable yeah, in this sense. So, of course, but that, that's, a, that's of course a point. I think we all agree on this. These are logical properties, right? <laughs> use cases that we have used now, we always have to have some additional rules to, uh, to get to the uh, industry use cases that uh, we need to achieve. So uh, yeah, I think we need something still beyond that. Uh, 
So many thanks to our speakers again and to the audience for leaving out all my boring questions. And uh, thank you again.